issues. We uh, represent whistleblowers from corporations and from the U.S. government and sometimes from other governments. Uh, we represent them in judicial proceedings and in negotiations. We also advise corporations and governments about what a robust whistleblower protection policy should look like. And from time to time, we do help draft legislation on uh, whistleblower protections here in the United States. Um, our executive director is with us tonight, Mark Cohen. He's standing at the back. And our two founders, Lou Clark, now GAP president, and Tom Devine, who is the legal director at GAP. So our entire hierarchy is, is here. <laughs> Um, we've been working on this issue for about 30 years. Uh, I joined the staff in 2006, <laughs> and a few years before that, GAP began to work on uh, whistleblower protections at the international organizations, uh, particularly the United Nations and the multilateral development banks. Um, now, and there's Tina Tinke, just now arriving from the, from the Inter-American Development Bank. Um, we, to be honest, were not sure that the issue of racial discrimination or uh, racial exclusion and ethnic exclusion were issues that really uh, pertain to us since we deal with whistleblowers. But about a year ago, a little over a year ago, a whistleblower came to us from the World Bank who told us that discrimination was uh, a significant problem and that there was widespread awareness of it inside the bank and there were, um, there were very few things that were being done to, to address it. And in response to that then, we uh, began to interview people who were referred to us and we reviewed studies that the bank itself had done over a period of years uh, to try to assess at least the parameters or the dimensions of, uh, of racial discrimination at the bank. And what we found, um, and it wasn't easy, we found that there had been between 1996 and 2003, 2004, a series of studies done at the bank that showed that discrimination based on race was a significant problem in employment, in promotion and retention at the bank. And that these studies um, showed this quantitatively, that uh, among other things that I can recall just off the top of my head, if you were Afro-descendant, you were 30% less likely to be a manager at the World Bank. You were much more likely to be hired in the lower rungs of the salary scale for the grade in which you were recruited. You were slower to be promoted. You were more likely to be confined to the administrative side of the bank as opposed to the operations side. If you were in operations, you were likely to be confined to the Africa region. So there was a whole uh, series of consistent findings that uh, were quantitatively documented by study after study. Um, we did see that discrimination as it is directed at black Americans appeared to be particularly intense and we understood anecdotally uh, from a number of people that at the World Bank, that is IBRD and IDA, uh, in June of 2009, there were fewer than five black Americans in the professional grades at the World Bank. And we, we, we feel that that number is pretty reliable, although we could not get it from any kind of quantitative source. But any time we asked anyone, the spontaneous reaction was they started to count on their fingers. And the names that were produced were the same names uh, over and over again. And I thought that that was, that was fairly telling. Um, so that was the study at, at the World Bank. Um, in addition to that, after finding that there was acknowledged internally 
at the administrative level a problem of racial discrimination in employment. We, we ask the question then, do people who work at the bank have access to legal remedy when they experience discrimination? And to see what the situation was with that, we looked at uh, the decisions of the administrative tribunal at the bank over a period of 12 years from 1996 to 2008. And in that 12 year period, we saw that there had been 21 complaints of racial discrimination brought to the tribunal, and the tribunal had not found for a complainant in a single instance. The bank had, the tribunal had found due process violations from time to time and awarded financial compensation to some complainants, but it was clear that the tribunal was very reluctant to issue a finding, uh, a judicial finding that discrimination was a problem in employment at the bank. Um, so what that meant then was that there was an acknowledged difficulty in recruitment, in promotion, and retention for Afro-descendants at the bank, and there was no judicial remedy. In fact, if you went to the tribunal, people told us you were likely to lose your case, and you would then be in the worst possible position for a whistleblower, that is, you're out, but you have no protection. So that was the study that we released in June of last year, and as a result of it, then a number of people came to us from the Inter-American Development Bank and said that the problem was also existent at, at, at the IDB. Um, at the IDB, the situation is a little different in that um, there was also concern about the lending practices and the extent to which lending at the IDB uh, was not targeted at Afro-Latino or indigenous populations. So it wasn't just a problem of employment, recruitment, promotion of the staff level, but it was also a concern about what were the lending practices of, of the bank. Now, both development banks, of course, are committed to the mitigation of poverty in the regions where they lend. In Latin America, uh, we found a consensus figure for population in Latin America is that roughly 150 million Latin Americans are Afro-Latino and self-identify as Afro-Latino. 50 million identify as indigenous people. So together, both populations uh, make up about 200 million people out of an overall population of 450 million. So 40% of the population of Latin America, the Americas, uh, is Afro-Latino or indigenous. And when we looked at the lending figures for the IDB, according to data given to us by the U.S. Executive Director's Office, for 2001 to 2005, the lending specifically targeting those two populations accounted for 0.13% of the bank's lending. And there was an error in that, which the bank then corrected for us. Uh, a, a major project in Brazil had been omitted, and when we added those funds, then the total funds came to about 2% of the IDB spending for a period of five years. Um, there were the same kinds of problems in recruitment and, and promotion and retention at the IDB as we found at, at the World Bank. Um, there were, however, signs of change at the IDB um, that distinguished it somewhat. That one thing we saw was that around the time of the World Conference Against Racism, sponsored by the UN in Durban, South Africa, there was uh, a great deal of, of at least vocal commitment on the part of the IDB to making some changes in lending practices and in employment practices. Um, and there was also and Executive Vice President Caper Dillon, who I think many of you know, who was extremely committed to doing something about uh, inequality in employment and lending at, at the IDB. She unfortunately departed in 2002, and as the impact of the UN conference in 2001 seemed to diminish, it seemed as if uh, there was less and less commitment by the um, administration at the IDB to addressing the problem of racial 
inequality there. Um, I think, though, it does show uh, two things, that if there is a sustained kind of public attention to an issue, that is, if the public is watching and makes it known that, that, that this issue is on the scope of public awareness, and if uh, there is high-level commitment from the authorities at the institution that it really is possible to make significant changes very quickly. So we kind of have a pathway to doing something, but um, what is needed is a sustained public awareness about the issue and a real commitment from the highest levels of the administration at both the World Bank and the IDB. Now what I'd like to do is introduce our two speakers who are here from the Inter-American Development Bank. Tina Tinde is the new uh, diversity advisor in the Department of Human Resources. And Andy Morrison is the new director of the Gender and Diversity Unit at the IDB. And I should mention that they uh, conducted an extremely uh, interesting and productive uh, two-day seminar in November at the bank on precisely this issue. So I want to turn it over to Tina. Hi, everyone. My name is Tina. And I joined the IDB last May as diversity advisor. It's the first post of its kind. It's in human resources. First of all, I would like to ask this group, and if you feel comfortable about it, <clears throat> I would like to ask people in this group, and listen carefully, I will say this only once, if uh, you have been felt discriminated against in professional terms uh, throughout your career, uh, and uh, please raise one hand if you have, please raise two hands if you have experienced this more than twice. Twice or more. Okay, and then, um, and then I would like to ask how many of us have filed a formal complaint about this uh, perception that we have been discriminated against? Please raise one or two hands. It shows that there are more of us that have experienced this. So that sort of sets the tone a little bit for how difficult these issues are. Um, <clears throat> I think it's been, um, I'd like to compliment the GAP for uh, studying these issues and making them public. I know there are some, um, we had some uh, comments to some of the lending numbers um, that I'm sure Andy will, uh, will comment on, my colleague, when he speaks about the operational side. Uh, I will focus on the human resources side. <clears throat> um, I need a lot of, I'm sort of in, in my job, I need a lot of lack of awareness of the value of diversity. Uh, IDB is the fourth international organization that I work in. So most of the things I say today will not necessarily apply only to IDB. They will apply to what I have learned from working on diversity and gender equality for about 20 years since I joined the UN um, Department of Public Information back in 1989. <coughs> I worked in the NGO section, so you can imagine the energy I got from people like um, like uh, Bella. What is her name? No, I'm <coughs> looking at all of you. I'm going a little bit. Bella Abzu with the hat. Yeah. <laughs> so I worked there and I was sort of trained as a young uh, idealist, trained by uh, Women's League for International Peace and Freedom and obviously many other uh, fantastic organizations. And I have, I have seen that it is not really easy to make it in international organizations. They are, they are just by their nature sort of a little bit traditional. Um, there's a lot of network-based um, uh, contact going on. And I have seen it as, you notice that I put two arms up, uh, didn't put two arms up about the filing a complaint. So I have noticed discrimination on many occasions. Uh, for being a woman, definitely. Um, I'm a single mother, and one time I didn't get a very interesting job in uh, an international organization in Vienna, because they told the foreign ministry of Norway, where I come from, that they couldn't see that a single mother with two kids would be able to actually be the deputy head of their information service. So, so much for working in Vienna. And I've had other experiences. So I just want to say that I, I know that there is discrimination out there. And um, so I've worked in these different organizations, the UN Council of the Baltic Sea States, and the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. And you know that refugees are about the most discriminated people in the world. 
Uh, so that has been a very, very good training uh, to come to IDB. And I, I must say that coming to IDB, I have, I have not been able to do the usual complaining that you do when you are a gender advisor, you get into the complaining group. You never have enough understanding, you don't have enough staff, you don't have enough budget. I'm sure I could focus on that here too, but I have seen a completely different situation at IDB. There is, as you know, there is an advantage of being high, of working with the boss that hired you. Haven't you noticed that the boss who hires you, they actually have a stake in your projects, a stake in your success. So I had that luxury that the head of human resources is the one who interviewed me. He's the one I told about all the initiatives that I had tried and some had worked and some had not. So, so that's already a good start. But there's also a keen interest at the top levels of the IDB to be addressing these issues, <coughs> to be fighting discrimination and to increase the, inc uh, the recruitment. I'm not saying that it's easy, but I feel that at least I'm very privileged. I have my assistant with me here today. Tamiya, would you mind standing up, please? So, Tamiya, thank you. <laughs> She's from Jamaica. So Tamiya and I have been working our way, uh, preparing the conference, and now we are facing the implementation of 10 conference resolutions. And I think many of you actually were there. So you know that the conference produced 115 brilliant um, diversity recommendations for IDB. Some of them address operations issues and some of them human resources. And uh, we selected 10 not because necessarily they were the best, but because they are things that we want to do this year and things that will give a lot of visibility and buy-in from the, from the managers, from the people who fight, from the countries that finance IDB, from our partners in the field. So, um, and many of those resolutions focus on awareness raising and training, which you know is really key. And um, we, will, we will, I have some good news for you today. Um, and that is that we will do a self-identification process in IDB. It has been uh, brewing for a long time, but now we will actually ask people whether they are Afro-descendant, indigenous, white Caucasian, Asian or other, or if they don't want to self-identify. And this is an issue that, as you know, will cause a lot of debate, but we will not go into a lot of the discussion because that has been going on for a long time. We will simply use those numbers so that we know who we have on board and so that we can set recruitment targets. And this is something that I would be so happy to do. So we're starting um, with in the end of January or early February, we will actually have this self-identification option available on the internet, on the human resources side, um, pages of, um, of IDB. Which means that, and I will be because not everybody wants to participate. But I had lunch with a half a descendant Brazilian colleague today. Um, and uh, she said, why do I have to do that? You, you know that I'm a Yeah. But, you know, so people have a lot of uh, different um, uh, angles on this. But I said, please, I need, you know, I need to know that because then we can set some targets. And um, we are learning a lot from DIFID, the British Development Corporation, about this, that are setting targets for the recruitment, not only of Afro-descendants, indigenous, but also for people with disabilities. So this is another issue that we are really following up on after their conference uh, resolutions. The number 10 resolutions is to include the uh, capacities and needs of uh, people with disabilities in everything that we do. So um, that's uh, that sort of sets the tone a little bit. We also have approved now a text which goes into all our vacancy announcements. So I was surprised when I applied there that um, IDB did not encourage women to apply. I think that's a very common thing to do. So you sort of see from the IDB website that it's a little bit of a traditional organization, but now we have a text which goes a step further, even than the World Bank, which we usually learn a lot from in terms of the diversity and inclusion work. Uh, they have more analysis. They have uh, they refer very often to the um, diversity criteria for recruitment. But we're going a little bit further, and we are encouraging women to apply. We are encouraging people of uh, uh, all types of um, all races, ethnicity. Um, and um, educational background to apply, and also people with disabilities and people who are living with HIV and AIDS. So we've had some discussions on this because obviously IDB would never ask for anybody's status on HIV and AIDS, but we would like to encourage people to apply to show that we are participating in, in trying to fight discrimination against the people who have, are living with HIV and AIDS. And this is already approved. I, th I think it might already be on the website. We just approved this last week, and we are now translating all of this into Portuguese. French and Spanish. 
So I'm very happy that we have made those steps. So when we get the, the numbers from the self-identification, we will be setting targets for recruitment. Um, we are very ambitious also on gender. You know that gender is, the, uh, from my perspective, it's the largest um, diversity um, criteria because it, it's not in conflict with any other. Uh, and uh, that is very important for IDB to increase the number of women with, with looking at diversity at the top levels. And um, we are trying now to get the full support for trying to reach 50% men and women at all levels. This has not been cast in stone yet, but uh, the World Bank has set this target for 2013, and I know it's not easy to try to, to make that, remember, at all levels. Um, you will see in my handout that there are statistics, we we'll can share those with you, that um, IDB now has 78% uh, men at the top level. Uh, it's um, actually been, yeah, we've been getting a little bit better over the past few years, but of course we're far from 50-50. Because discrimination issues, whether it's against women or underrepresented groups, it, it really deals with some of the same concepts. Okay, maybe I should give the floor to uh, my colleague. Would you like to, to uh, speak? And thank you very much. Thank you. I look forward to the discussion. So good evening. My name is Andy Morrison. unit was created in 2007. Um, the distinction between what Tina does and what I do is Tina focuses on diversity issues and cyber and human resource issues. The unit that I head um, focuses on making sure the issues of gender equality uh, and the development of African descendants and, uh, and uh, indigenous peoples is addressed in the way that the IDB puts together its projects and all its activities, both its projects and its analytical work. I'd like to start by introducing a member of my team who's with me, me here today. Uh, that's Judy Morrison. Can you stand up, Judy, in the back? Um, I need to say two things about Judy. First of all, the fact that we have the same last name does not violate any IDB nepotism or there's absolutely no biological relationship with us, between us. Um, Judy comes from the, to the IDB from directing uh, programs at the American Foundation and the Dialogue and Race at the, at the, at the uh, Inter-American Dialogue. Um, and I'm really delighted to have her as a senior advisor on African descent and indigenous issues. Um, just briefly and biographically, um, I'm a recovering academic. I spent 10, eight years at Tulane University. Spent seven years at IDB, eight years at the World Bank, where I was um, the lead economist for gender at the World Bank, and just recently returned uh, to, to the IDB. Um, first, let me address this, the comment to, to, to be, be the report is a good report. We appreciate at the IDB, we appreciate the report. I would like at the outset to, to identify two or three recommendations from the report that I think are really important to our work program that, that, that we endorse and that we agree with. Um, the first um, is the recommendation that it's important to address issues of race and ethnicity where appropriate in country dialogues and country strategies. And many of you are very familiar with multilaterals, development banks, others aren't. The heart of what we do is country dialogues and country strategies where the bank sits down with our partner governments and decides what we're going to work on over the coming years. Um, the bank has done background studies in some 10 or 11 countries addressing issues of indigenous peoples and Afro descendants to inform the country strategies. But as one of the priorities of, of my unit going forward is to make sure that we do this in more systematic ways and that these issues are brought forth when the governments and the banks sit down to talk about what we're going to do. A second recommendation of the report is that better data needed in the IDB quote should compile and analyze data on race, ethnicity, and poverty. Obviously, quality data and quality analysis are essential to do good programming and to do good loan operations and to get, do good um, grant operations. We fully endorse that. Um, I think, as B may mentioned in her remarks, the IDB um, was in, under Burke Dillon's leadership was very important in this initiative with a, something called Todos Contamos, We All Count. Uh, where they work with census departments and national statistic institutes around the region to a better job of collecting data on, on, on race and ethnicity. Um, we are committed to renewing the vigor of that work. 
Uh, I think it needs to go beyond censuses to household surveys, and we will be developing a program to, to, to do a better job on data collection. Um, a third um, uh, recommendation is that the IDB must gather, analyze, and publish information about the impact and effectiveness of its operations and procurement activities on Afro, Latino, and indigenous populations. Um, I think before the report came out, but so I, I wouldn't attribute this to the report, but the, the, the evaluation office of the bank has taken on impact evaluation, an, an overall impact evaluation of the bank's activities and its impact on indigenous peoples. I think that's a step forward and we have a lot to, to, to learn from that, from that initiative. Um, and I think development and effectiveness is near and dear to all our hearts. So I just wanted to recognize that, I, that, that personally I think the report was a serious report. I think it's had uh, important discussions, there's been important discussions of it inside the IDB and I want to thank you for it. Um, I guess I'd like to um, address a couple other issues. The report was very critical of IDB, and you, in, in your remarks today, you talked about the volume of lending which addresses um, Afro-descended peoples. Um, and you quoted it as being 2%. I think that's a significant undercut. Um, I think that's, um, and I understand that you're working with data that the, the Inter-American Development Bank gave to you to generate that figure of 2%. I think we need to do a much better job of tracking investments and their impacts on indigenous peoples, on women, um, and, and on Afro-descendants. But it's not as easy as just identifying standalone projects which benefit African descendants or benefit indigenous peoples. Because many of the IDB's huge investments in infrastructure, in conditional cash transfer programs, like the famous program Bosa School in Brazil, or the famous program Oportunidades, uh, formerly Progresa in Mexico, have huge amounts of populations which, which are indigenous, which are Afro-descendant, which are benefiting from these operations. So I think as we develop tracking systems, we can't focus on the relatively small percent of projects which are going to be standalone, specifically benefiting disadvantaged communities. We need to look at how disadvantaged groups are benefited overall in IDB projects. And like Tina, I come bearing some good tidings in the sense that the IDB Ninth Replenishment, the IDB right now is undergoing, is, try, is um, uh, enlisting promises from donor governments to, to recapitalize the bank for other more years of activities. Um, the institution has agreed to disaggregate its performance targets, its output targets for the what is it doing by um, race and ethnicity, where relevant. I think this is a big step forward. Now, it, um, so, for example, in, in students, in, in students uh, receiving uh, instruction as a result of IDB projects, we'll make sure that we um, sex disaggregate that because in, uh, in Latin America, school abandonment has a gender face. It's a male gender face in the Caribbean and Central America. Um, it, in other areas, we'll do disaggregations by, 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 by ethnicity and by race. I think that's an important commitment. Um, In the area of, of country uh, of country dialogue, um, as I said before, we've done some background studies. I think in country dialogues, issues of race, ethnicity, gender need to be addressed more systematically. Um, I'd like to simply close by looking forward a little bit and talking a little bit about specific initiatives that we're going to be, under, going to be undertaking. Um, we will be producing a statistical publication every two years that looks at the state of social, social exclusion in Latin America, um, where we look at and produce data to the extent that possible that looks at social exclusion by race, by ethnicity, by gender. Um, we will use both hard data coming from household surveys, we'll use soft data on perceptions, we'll look at good practice programs to address issues of social exclusion. Um, we um, are going to be committed to trying to influence the huge amounts of IDB investments on infrastructure, to look at, to try and measure the degree to which indigenous and Afro-descended populations are underserved in the big infrastructure projects in the bank, and developing toolkits that allow um, project teams working on infrastructure to, to do a better job. 
So in closing, I, I, I'd like to endorse what the report said about you know the 200 million estimated people who are African descendant or indigenous are more likely to be poor than other people in the region. And one of the IDD's principal mission is poverty alleviation. We cannot do a good job of poverty alleviation without addressing the needs of indigenous peoples and African descendants. And um, we look forward to your comments and to, to dialogue to uh, help us do a better job in doing that.